Well, welcome everybody to the annual pre-session briefing sponsored by Forum News Service. I'm Don Davis. I think most of you know me, at least the four at the table. We have simple format here today. The reporters ask questions and the four of you answer questions. And we can follow up and we can keep asking until you answer them. We'll be here up to 90 minutes. If the questions slow down, we, can, um, we may want to corner you with some one-on-one -on -one questions. And I think most people know, but sorry to say, Governor Dayton um, called in sick today. He canceled all his appearances. So there's nobody speaking for him. But they're probably, with four legislative leaders, there's enough people speaking today. We have Speaker Kurt Dowd. We have Senator Paul Gizelka, who will be majority leader. We have Senator Tom Bach, who will be minority leader. And we have Representative Melissa Hortman, who will be minority leader in the House. I think I want to, uh, generally, I want to emphasize the reporters who don't get the chance to talk to you as much. So the two or three of them will have questions they want. But I'm going to start out with a question. The last time Republicans were in charge of the House and Senate and Governor Dayton was in office, it didn't work out so well. It had a state government shutdown. And here in the last few weeks, few months, since May, since you adjourned, things haven't worked out too well setting up a special session uh, with a talk of three issues that pretty much everybody agreed could be handled in a special session. What can you for do to assure Minnesotans that you're going to get your work done this year? Speaker, let's start with you. Sure. Well, thank you, uh, Don, for organizing this. Thank you, everybody else, for, uh, for participating. It's always fun uh, for us to get to do this. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to do things slightly differently. Uh, one of the things that I have heard over the last couple of years that's been the biggest frustration, actually not a couple of years, the last f four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 years, is this bunching up of business at the end of the legislative session. Uh, people don't like that. It's not transparent. A, a few people going into a room um, trying to work out uh, the differences for, for everyone um, is not a successful model for transparency and, and uh, those sorts of things. So uh, my goal is going to be to, uh, and I've said this frequently already and, and I will continue to say it, we're going to conduct the business of the state this year in uh, the committees. Uh, we're going we're gonna to do our negotiations and, and conduct the business of the state uh, in, in the committees, in the legislative process, where the people can come and testify and, and have a voice in the process. Um, traditionally, uh, the governor has not been very active during the legislative session. Uh, I assume uh, because law says he has to, he's going to present a budget very shortly. Um, you know, he said that he's going to present a tax bill and a bonding bill as well. He said that last week. Um, the, the governor knows how the legislative process works. Um, he needs to send his commissioners to committee. He needs to authorize them to speak and, and to answer on his behalf uh, because that's where the business is going to get done this year. And I think, I think that will help the process uh, not only uh, be more transparent but, but uh, help us get done on time. We're not going to bunch it up till the end. Let's go to who will be a rookie majority leader, Senator Gazelka. Hopefully I'll be the rookie of the year. Uh, and and uh, the speaker and I have not talked about this, but uh, I'll, I'll address that first. Um, uh, we definitely want to work and move things forward at a faster pace so that there's more time at the end. Uh, we hope that the governor comes to negotiate with us. It'll be our intention that that happens. Uh, if not, I'm willing to pass some bills if, if we have roadblocks that he can decide whether he's going to accept them or veto them. And if he's going to veto them, tell us why you're vetoing them so that we have ample time to work on it. But that's similar to what the speakers talked about. Uh, I think the other thing, uh, because I'm new and uh, wasn't uh, involved in the, the campaign process as much, uh, I have maybe a slightly different view in that I think we ought to lower, lower the tone of some of the things that uh, are, has been going on the last few months. Uh, 
and it's because we're all frustrated and we want to get it done. But um, and I don't want I don't even want to blame anybody at this point. I'd rather just let's lower the tone a little bit and, and figure out how we can actually work on some of the things that we're all talking about. So whether that's the health care crisis, transportation, tax relief, bonding, those are all issues that we're all talking about. And I think we can get there. And that, I think, will be one of the components. Uh, you'll see a slightly different tone from Senate Republicans. Let, let's go to Senator Bach. You're only one vote behind Senator Gazelka's caucus. What can you do to make sure the work gets done? Well, uh, first, uh, thank you all for inviting us here. Uh, and uh, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, if I don't get a chance to say that. Uh, uh, you know, if you're one behind, you might as well be six behind, uh, because the fact of life is uh, Senate Republicans have the votes on the floor to execute uh, what, whatever issues that their caucus can uh, unite behind. Uh, so I don't know that we're going to have a lot of influence. Uh, the, the good news, I think, going in is Senator Gazelka and I think have a good relationship. I can't think of a time where we've ever had crosswords. We served on the tax committee together uh, for a few years. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I think what would be helpful was is for the conference committees to really reach out to the governor. Uh, the governor is going to submit a budget, and like all governors before him, they then will kind of step back, and uh, the governor's budget will be taken through the regular committee process, and there'll be public testimony on it, and the legislature eventually will develop their own bills. And uh, but I just would encourage the two leaders. Uh, to reach out to the governor so that in that conference committee process uh, we know what the governor is willing to accept and what he's not uh, so that we don't all get surprised after we all go home. Uh, and uh, I think if uh, they can accomplish that, I think we'll have a productive session that will develop a, a, a good budget for our state for the next two years. And Representative Hortman. Well, I think all uh, three of the gentlemen who have gone before me have made points that are worth repeating. I agree with Speaker Doubt that we have a process for passing legislation and resolving differences between the two bodies. We have 201 members of the House and the Senate, and there is no reason that the two top leaders and the governor should sit in a room and try to figure out uh, 36 to $40 billion worth of spending by themselves and aggregate those decisions onto a small group of people. So process is number one. We have a process that, when used, works. Um, what Senator Gazelka said is we need a different tone, and I think he and I, as the new players in, in the equation, bring that. We're not um, from, we don't have access to grind from the previous disagreements of the past couple of years, so hopefully we bring that fresh perspective. And I think that he's right, what we're all for is making Minnesota a better place. This is why people run for office, and we all have that in common. We, we, we can focus on that. We'll be doing better. And I think uh, what Senator Box said that, that bears repeating is that the majority should listen to the minority and listen to Governor Dayton, and not just when we get to the com conference committee process, but through the process. As we are assembling the bills, it will be rather clear from the outset, from the governor's budget, and from certain strongly held DFL values, values that there are some things that are non-starters. And inclusion of those things in final budget bills are likely to create problems. We can see the train wrecks coming before the train wrecks happen. So I would say if the majorities will listen to the minority, we will be a pretty good um, antenna of what, what you're going to hear from the governor. We're pretty aligned as DFLers, united in our values for protecting working families in Minnesota and strongly believing in great education. So if, if there's good listening on the early end, then we shouldn't have bills that result in a train wreck on the end. And I have to ask a follow-up to, to represent doubt. Can you and the governor get along? You know, I think so. Um, I will tell you that uh, the relationship is damaged right now. Uh, I'll be very honest with you about that. Uh, you know, I think he has done and said some things that I don't think were appropriate. I probably uh, have responded in a way that, that wasn't the best. But, um, you know, I have done a lot in the last uh, two years and even four years to reach out to him and to build a personal relationship. Um, my impression right now is that I value the personal relationship more than he does. Um, and this is a relationship business. Uh, the governor is going to put forth an agenda, uh, you know, 
a budget uh, that he's going to want to get passed. He needs relationships in the legislature to pass his agenda. There's no other way uh, to get it done. He can't sign a bill that we don't send him. So we need to work together. We've got to solve some big issues, some big problems. We've got MNsure and the, and the health insurance crisis. Um, we have a state budget to, to take care of. We have the unfinished business of a bonding bill and a tax bill uh, that's been kind of waiting. Um, in order to get those things done, we have to have better relationships. And, and uh, so, you know, I've always, I'm not, I'm also not somebody that holds, holds grudges, so I can get over it pretty quickly. But um, it's going to take some effort on the governor's part to, to reach out. One other quick follow up for all of you. When we're writing our stories, should we be using the term shutdown in those? Is there a chance of a shutdown, folks? Why would you want to use that term? In, in 2011, at this point, we were using term shutdown, and it, that certainly was accurate. In fact, if I can make a comment, so I was there in 2011 and 12, we were in the majority. Uh, it was a $6 billion shortfall. Here we have a $1.4 billion surplus, so it's not the same crisis as we had then. Plus, you had a lot of new people in the Senate uh, on the Republican side that never in 40 years had been in the majority. Now it's two out of the last three times we're in the majority, and so it's a totally different makeup. But one other thing I wanted to mention uh, re regarding the Speaker and Bach, the present majority leader, you know, they both had conflicts with the governor, and, you know, it's, it's how do we... How do we move from where we are? But I, I think the governor has good intentions, and we all have good intentions here. And in the end, uh, you know, if we change the tone a little bit, and like the speaker said, continue to build relationships, clear the slate, I think we can do it. And I, I'm convinced that we will do it. I don't think you need to use the word shut down, because uh, I think one key difference is if the speaker is serious about using the process. Uh, one of the things that's that's <clears throat> readily available to us is setting interim deadlines that make it clear that we have enough time to redo bills if the governor vetoes them. Really good example is when uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher was the speaker for four years, and uh, Larry Pogamler, I believe, was running the Senate at the time, and, and we had Tim Plenty from 2007 through 2010. And we knew that for our party faithful, we at times wanted to send a very clear budget bill that stated our priorities as Democrats, and we knew just as clearly that Governor Pawlenty would veto it. But what we did is we left enough time to put second bills together that met in the middle. Um, this is a no negotiating process, and as long as you leave enough time for the first offer to be turned down and, and enough time to make a counter offer, there's no reason anybody should have to talk about a shutdown. Do you want to add anything, Senator Bach? I'm looking down to where a couple of Greater Minnesota reporters are. If you have questions, you get the priority. Don't all speak at once. And if you don't, that's fine. Anybody else? Or are we all done? Let's go ahead. That's me. Um, I have a number of questions about... And the please identify oh, yourself. Sorry. Just I didn't tell you that before. Esme Murphy with WCCO-TV and radio. Um, I do have a number of questions about the future of Minsure slash Obamacare, especially in light of what is going on in Washington, with Republicans saying they plan to repeal it and provide what they are referring to as universal access, which I haven't seen very well defined, that this is probably going to happen very quickly. Where do you go from here? What kinds of steps are you taking? Uh, and where, I would like to start with the Republican leadership here. What are you folks going to do, and also about the future of it, and also what are you going to do with the more than 100,000 people who don't qualify for those tax credits, who are facing exorbitant increases in their premiums with enormous deductibles? Uh, so I, I agree with you that uh, it will be unraveled at the federal level. I think they've made that pretty clear. Uh, what we don't know is how fast that process will be and exactly what that means to Minnesota. But in Minnesota, we also have Minsure that is still there, whether that changes. And so, you know, one of the first things I know we have to address is the high-risk pool. Uh, we eliminated Min, uh, MSHA, Minnesota Comprehensive Health Association, and all of those people were poured into Minsure, which was a much smaller pool that handled that high-risk group. So that's why you saw rates going up as much as 67% for the small business owner, the farmer, the people that were in there. So we have to find either through reinsurance or 
MSHA 2.0 or something, we have to have a high risk pool that spreads out to a much broader group. So that'll be one of the number one things we have to do right away. It's because of that that I, th I think all of us here want to prefer, uh, provide healthcare premium relief to those that are in that product because it wasn't really any fault of their own that some of them are paying premiums as high as $30,000 a year with a high deductible. So, so we're gonna do those, because it didn't happen in a special session, you should see that as the number one bill out of the House and Senate. And how, how quickly, I mean, with all due respect, I mean, some of the families are paying significantly more than that. Um, families, $40,000 a year with a $13,000 $13, deductible. How quickly can they expect relief from you? And, uh, and how quickly, can you get this all together? I mean, this is a crisis for these families. Sure. Uh, thank you, Esme. We, you know, I think the, the problem that we will face is we'll have a new uh, Congress and a new uh, administration in Washington, D.C. They will unravel this. Uh, I think we all know that that will not happen before we need to take action um, in reforming what we currently have here in Minnesota in order to have an impact on the policies that people buy on January 1st of 2018. We think that deadline is sometime in March. I'm not sure that we will know uh, what the federal government is doing before that deadline. So there's a couple of things that, that they could do. One, kind of tilt your hand to us, let us know what you're thinking. Um, number two is on day one of the new administration, uh, they could approve some waivers that would allow us to kind of restructure what we're doing here. Um, some variances from uh, the, the requirements of the federal law. Um, one of those would be putting back in place some sort of a, a high-risk pool. I think everybody understands uh, very, very clearly that that's what the main problem was. We had a small pool of people in the individual marketplace, and uh, we threw the high-risk people into that pool, um, and it just skyrocketed the rates for everyone. So we have to somehow put in place either a reinsurance or a, or a high-risk pool. Um, it's going to take some time for us to do that. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight. So, but. We need, to, we need to take serious reform action by, I think probably, I would shoot for the middle of March, but I think by the end of March, uh, probably for sure, for us to, to really impact the policies that people are buying on, on January 1st of 2018. Um, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, so we need to kind of look for some clues of what the federal government's going to do and also ask for waivers from the federal government so they can let us get to work right away. Um, and setting something up here that'll work for Minnesotans. But in terms of actual, some kind of rebate or relief, you're, you're saying probably not until the well, end of Well, no, no, there's two parts. That's the long term, what I was just talking about. The short term, giving some premium relief, I think uh, the Senator said that, I, th I think everyone here supports giving premium relief to Minnesotans. Um, you know, obviously our, our talks for a special session kind of fell apart last week. Um, our, our criticism of the governor is, number one, he waited too long to tell us about the problem. He knew about the problem back on May 1st, he waited until uh, almost October 1st, September 30th, before he told us how bad the problem was. And by then it was too late for the legislature to take any substantive, meaningful uh, reforms that could have affected things for January 1st of 2017. Um, number two, uh, his plan, uh, I, I called, uh, what, what was that? I don't even remember the word that I used. To, uh, it, 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 it didn't go far enough. Um, he is doing the absolutely minimum thing that we could do for Minnesotans. Um, and, and the thing that he has said is that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's what we can implement. Well, they don't have to do anything. All they have to do is write a check when the plans send an invoice. The state would have to do nothing to implement his plan. Nothing. Um, I think we owe it owe Minnesotans more than to just give them the absolute bare minimum. We must do premium relief, but the, the governor's also not being honest. His premium relief, relief will likely not take place or, or not impact, not, that money won't show up in people's pockets until April 1st. Um, I, I think people are gonna want help sooner than that. Um, so, and it's not just the money, but we have to deal with the access part too. We have people that are, are potentially getting life-saving cancer treatments at Mayo Clinic. That, that because of their new policies, that will stop on January 1st. I think there are things we can do to ensure some continuity of care so people can continue those, uh, even if it's for 90 days, to help those people through until we can get into the legislative session and hopefully take further action um, that can help them right now. But uh, throwing people out of their potentially life-saving cancer treatments is, is gonna be a recipe for disaster. And, and we also have the situation where people in greater Minnesota are driving an hour or two hours past one, two, three clinics or hospitals to get to a, a clinic that will take their health insurance. That's unacceptable. 
Well, it's, it's kind I of a follow-up. One, one yeah. follow-up here. I mean, it, Blue Cross Blue Shield pulled out in July. I mean, this wasn't as if everybody learned about this in October. Everyone well, we could didn't know about the caps, though, Esme. There, there was a lot of things we didn't know about this. Until, we didn't know how bad it was until September 30th. Well, Senator Bach, I mean, obviously, the, uh, in rural Minnesota, this is really hitting hard. I mean, what are your thoughts about this? Well, I, 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 I am a little interested to see how my Republican colleagues are going to handle this, because uh, they had a lot of fun with it on the campaign trail. And now making the transition to governing and actually having to find some solutions is going to be really hard work. And, you know, the Senate last year, uh, and I wish them the best, and we've got some uh, some good quality people in our caucus, I think, that are, are willing to roll their sleeves up and try to find some solutions. Uh, I hope we have a better outcome than last year because, you know, this problem wasn't new. Uh, the Senate last year in our Health and Human Service Bill had four or five reforms we thought that needed to be made to Minsure. Uh, and we, in conference, we couldn't get the House Republicans to consider any of them. So none of them happened. So. This isn't new to us. Uh, we're, this is one of the areas where we're absolutely willing uh, to participate and try to find a solution. Uh, I've got a neighbor that's in that individual market, and he's the first one, a little self-employed uh, CPA. He was the very first person that raised this issue with me when he came down the driveway and said, Tom, what are we going to do uh, back in October when he, got, when he found out what his premiums were going to be? So, there are real faces on these 121,000 people or so, and I know some of them. And uh, I hope we can avoid the partisanship at the legislature and with the governor and move beyond the campaign now and, and start to work hard uh, on finding some solution, short and long term, for a serious problem in our state. What's really frustrating to me is that we have within our power to provide immediate relief. And there's absolutely no good excuse for why we are not having a special session tomorrow to provide relief to families who need it right now. All four of us on December 2nd all agreed, we're not crazy about relief without reform, but we all agreed that to help these families, this was something we're willing to live with in the short term. And the idea that these families have to wait four months for even some sort of the outlines of an answer is inexcusable. I think when we have it within our power to help Minnesotans and we don't help Minnesotans, there's no excuse for that. That's our job. Uh, what's really frustrating is to hear the speaker talk about the governor's plan as minimum. Well, if what the governor is proposing is minimum, he's below the minimum because he's not proposing any relief anytime soon. So. Uh, you know, the, the governor put forth more than 80 pages of very specific uh, outline of exactly what would be entailed in the special session. And all we've heard as a reason of why we're not doing it is just complaints. We've never seen a written counteroffer, and particularly on the premium relief. I have not heard a single reason why we shouldn't do this tomorrow. Speaker Dow, we have a couple follow-up questions, but you seem to... Not be liking what you're hearing right now. I mean, we just have to be accurate. Immediate relief is not relief that takes place on, on April 1st. And, and at best, based on what the plans are telling us, you could maybe say that if everything went perfectly, you could get, Minnesotans would get relief on March 1st. Still not immediate, okay? But that's best case scenario. And, and based on the track record of the administration over the last four years, I think it's safe for me to say when the plans say eight to 12 weeks, I'll take the 12 week one just so, so we don't overpromise to Minnesotans. That's why I say April 1st. That's a very realistic number. The governor said February 1st. There isn't a soul on the planet, including the plans who are saying they can get this done by February 1st. Can't happen, okay? That's a lie. That's not true. And we shouldn't tell Minnesotans that they're going to have relief on February 1st when there isn't a chance in the world that they will get it. That's letting Minnesotans down, okay? And, and to say that we didn't put a plan forward, it just isn't accurate. I mean, I, we had five proposals uh, or, or provisions that, that we had talked about for months. We had specific language in bill format that we gave to the governor um, that would have helped people with the access part of this continuity of care for 90 days, um, and other pieces that would have helped Minnesotans right away on January 1st. Um, now they're going to have a little delay, uh, but we can hopefully backdate that to January 1st so that people can continue their uh, treatments at Mayo and other places um, and, and make sure that we live up to the promises that were made. And let's not forget that when this thing was passed, and I know everybody wants to separate themselves, I, I, I hope folks noticed what the governor said on Friday, that, that 
this wasn't anything that, that Democrats in Minnesota and the governor did. Uh, that this was something the federal government imposed and we just implemented it here in Minnesota. And that, that Minsure isn't responsible for this, it's just the travelocity. Go back, look at the tapes when this was passed on the House floor and on the Senate floor, at the promises that were made to Minnesotans. They were promised they were gonna have lower cost coverage and better access and more choices. Neither of those things happened. Those are broken promises to Minnesotans. And, and I, I'm sorry, you can't pass the buck. The governor needs to step up and take more responsibility and show that he's being more aggressive to work towards solutions that are gonna really help Minnesotans on January 1st. His, his, the word I was looking for, uninspiring. His plan is uninspiring. And, and it's not gonna help Minnesotans on January 1st. It's, it's the least that, Minnesota, that, that the state can do to help Minnesotans, the least. Okay, let's talk about January, and I think this kind of constitutes a follow-up. Do I have to, uh, I'll introduce myself. Mary LaHammer, Twin Cities PBS. So what is House file and Senate file one? Is it mid-chair and healthcare? Yes. Both of you have decided yes. that in House and Senate. Okay, and then another follow-up to Don's we question. We didn't decide that, and we don't even have to look at each other yeah. to both say yes. Know that. Uh, okay. Very obviously, that's the biggest issue that we have to deal with this session. We have to. Um, it is a crisis for Minnesotans, and although we didn't create it, uh, Minnesotans chose to go a different direction in the last election, and they, they chose us to fix the problem, and we will. Okay, another follow-up. Don opened with the scenario last time we had this same composure of the governor's office and the legislature, an all-Republican legislature, a DFL governor, and constitutional amendments were popular. It's a way you can get around the governor. What is the appetite, particularly for the two Republican leaders, for any constitutional amendments? Uh, on my part, uh, I can say that we haven't talked about any constitutional amendments yet. I'm not saying we won't do them, but uh, unless we have 34 people that agree that that's a good idea, we're not going to do it. Uh, and the, the, the two that came forth last time were both very controversial. And, and we know um, that we have, with just 34, you have to get a lot of other things done first, in my opinion. And so that's what we're going to focus on. Every, everywhere I've gone, I've talked about we're going to focus on the main thing being the main thing. And that's the health care reform and relief, a transportation bill without a gas tax increase, and hopefully tax relief. Those are some things that we consistently talk about that we want to do. Mr. Speaker, isn't it tempting to work around the governor and uh, do constitutional amendments? You know, it's, it, and I agree with the senator. I, we have not had that conversation, and I have not had anyone approach me saying, hey, we just absolutely have to do this constitutional amendment now that we have the majority. Um, I think my caucus is focused on, number one, uh, reforming uh, the health insurance and Minsure, uh, getting some help to folks uh, who are suffering because of that. Uh, number two, we've got to set a state budget that prioritizes you know, things that, that, that we all care about as Minnesotans. And, and part of that will be some tax relief for Minnesotans. Uh, it's been two years since uh, we've had a tax bill and, and you know, the governor has done all he can to block tax relief back to Minnesotans, um, but it's, it's overdue. We do have a surplus in the state budget and I think Minnesotans deserve to get some of their money back. Democrats, can, yeah, can minority. Yes. comment on that first too? I mean, the, the tax bill, I was on the tax conference committee and Senator Bach and I were on the tax committee itself, but that tax bill was the most bipartisan bill I think I've ever seen for a tax bill. You had I believe 89% of all legislators, House, Senate, Democrat, Republican, signed it. So, I mean, and, and get it to the governor. And so that was frustrating for us. I don't think it was, uh, I, I'm just surprised that we couldn't get that one done. And so we'll keep working towards that. Could I get the minority leaders to weigh in too? You both were around last time we had constitutional amendments and government shutdowns and that whole environment. What would be your fear of working around the governor and Republicans perhaps going straight to the voters on issues? Well, I, I think uh, if I could give them some advice, uh, uh, I would think, I wouldn't rule out the idea of constitutional amendments, but I think what they should think about is constitutional amendments that might be related to good government. And I was reminded myself when I turned over my ballot on November 8th and I saw all those judges. And one was opposed and I didn't know anything about any of them and I'm an elected official. And so there's been one floating around on judicial retention uh, that uh, I think Senator Rest has been the author in the Senate. I'm still interested in that. Frankly, the reason that we didn't try push it in the Senate is we couldn't find any traction in the House under Democratic control in 13-14 or under Republican control in 15-16.
But, and I'm sure there are others. Uh, so I, I guess I would just like them to think about, are there some good government things that we could probably pretty bipartisanly agree on? That's the one I would suggest they take a look at. You know, in, in that vein, a redistricting commission would probably be a pretty good idea to look at. I, I say that without authorization of my caucus. Um, but when you look at uh, the failure of the political process here in Minnesota to use the political process to draw maps, it makes sense to put that in the hands of disinterested, uh, data-conscious people and not politicians. Uh, Tom Hauser from Channel 5. Uh, Speaker Doubt, you said last week that there would not likely be a bonding bill in the coming session. Can you again explain your rationale for that? And I'd like reaction from everybody else about you know, whether there should be a bonding bill. Obviously, that's up to uh, our caucus. Uh, our priority this first year of the biennium is going to be on uh, reforming health care and, and setting a state budget, providing some tax relief. It's not traditionally a, a bonding year. I know you all know that. Um, although we have done smaller bonding bills in the first year of the biennium for sometime. Um, you know, the, the, the governor made some choices last week uh, in, in what I think was a deliberate effort to, to scuttle a special session. Um, we had, you know, he stood before you on December 2nd and told you what, what was going to be handled and dealt with in a special session. We put up what I called guardrails uh, and asked others to go to work and negotiate the, the details of those bills. Um, if folks are wondering what compromise looks like in St. Paul, I'll tell you what the governor's compromise looks like. Uh, in that bonding bill, he was requesting that we take all of the transportation projects out of the, out of the bill that we had put in. Um, and he wanted all of his projects left in the bill. And then in his letter last Tuesday, he actually threw in uh, quite a few additional projects that had some had never been talked about before. Um, and some had been off the table for six months. Um, I can't look at what he did and what he put in that letter and come to any other conclusion than to say that he was deliberately trying to stop a special session from happening. And, and let me go one step further. By stopping a, a special session from happening, he was stopping that bonding bill. Um, I don't know what he would tell you if he was here, if he would tell you it wasn't big enough. Um, he wasn't getting enough of what he wanted. He was basically getting everything he wanted uh, in, in his proposal. Um, but he deviated so far from what we had talked about it, it just, that's what blew up the negotiations. Whether we have one or not in the, in the next year um, is, is going to be a, a matter for you know, our new bonding or capital investment chair and members of his committee and for our caucus to decide if, if there are things that we need to do. I would guess if we do one, it'll be a smaller one, but I don't know, and, and, and we'll work through that process. But I, I also think the governor sent a pretty clear message um, by his efforts that he wasn't interested in a bonding bill. Senator Gazalka, do you uh, agree, or are there, are there projects that your constituents want and that shouldn't, this shouldn't be hung up due to politics? So we're, we're open to a bonding bill, uh, but it would be end of session, and somehow I think it will be tied to tax relief and a tax bill, it, I, just as I understand how politics works. Uh, and it'll be unique in the Senate that we need 41 votes and we have 34 Republicans, so Senator Bach and I will be working on what should be in there if we're going to have one. Uh, I, my suggestion would be uh, the governor, I think, said he was going to submit a bonding bill to us, I think he said in the first week or so. Uh, my suggestion would be they take that bonding bill to the appropriate committees and have hearings on it. There is not a lot going to happen at the legislature until the February budget forecast comes out, which is like March 1st. Uh, there's a bunch of new members that are going to get their orientations to all of the state departments and their committees, uh, and that's very important. Uh, but I do think there's ample time to start working on a bonding bill uh, before the February budget forecast comes out. I think if we could find a bipartisan agreement and pass one, I think Minnesota would be well served. Uh, you know, we're going to fall a billion dollars behind now in, in investment in public infrastructure and, and coming out of the construction industry, I can just tell you, those projects aren't going to get cheaper if we decide to wait two years to pass it. Uh, we're not only going to get behind projects, they're going to get more expensive. So I, uh, I would encourage them to take the governor's proposal seriously, take it through the committee process, modify it how you want. Uh, but, but I think passing one sooner is better. I think getting it wrapped up in the end of session negotiations just make concluding the whole budget that much more difficult. 
I think if the speaker was really interested in uh, passing a bonding bill in special session, he had a really simple solution. It's called written counteroffer. The governor made a very clear 80-page explicit offer of precisely what would be included in the special session and never got any written counteroffer. We don't pass conversations. We don't pass conversations whether they have guardrails or concepts in them. We pass bills. And so if you can't write down your proposed deal on a piece of paper, then it's not a deal. And, and I don't know how seriously we should take complaints that don't come with a written counteroffer. I just I like to take people at their word, and I think we were all there when the governor stood on December 2nd and said, this is how we are going to work this process. We have a, 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 a guideline of, of what we think this looks like, but we're going to leave it up to the committee chairs and the, and the uh, commissioners to work out the details of what that will look like. Um, the governor is the one that deviated from that. We didn't agree on December 2nd, and it was the governor's own words that said we weren't going to fire offers back and forth. So um, obviously we didn't start firing offers back and, and forth until we could play politics on, on where in the world were uh, the legislative leaders and try to make some political hay out of that. Minnesotans expect better. And, and I don't think we want political games. I think we want solutions. And, and you know we talked about how we were going to work that out. And it was the governor that deviated from that, unfortunately. So negotiations going to be done in public? Yes. Yep. In rooms that look just like this. It'll be great. You will have access to all of it. All four of you agree? I recommend that the offers and counteroffers be put in writing so that we know exactly what the proposed deal is because the problem that we ended up with at the end of session uh, last year is, is the speaker and the Senate Majority Leader thought they had a deal that couldn't be reduced to a writing. It didn't stand up the process of getting written down. Senator Gazelka is moving up to the microphone. Well, I'm certainly willing to have everything in open. I think uh, people like that. Uh, would I ever say that I would go behind a closed door with the governor and talk Turkey? I might. Senator Bach, advice? Well, I mean, the Senate Democrats are willing to play whatever role we're asked. Uh, we're in the minority here, and, and if Senator Gazelka wants me to be part of that negotiation process uh, that he has with the House and the governor, uh, I'm willing to do that. If the governor asks, I'm willing to do that. Kevin Fedley, Capital Report and Politics in Minnesota. Um, on this very question, I'd like to ask in a slightly different way. What we saw Friday appeared less a set of negotiations done in public uh, and more like a publicly arranged marital spat. <laughs> Is that really the way to conduct business? Is that the way to go about this, these kinds of performances? Well, you know, one of my frustrations uh, has been the, f the fact that the governor does not participate in the legislative session. Uh, I can't tell you how many times the governor has sent his commissioners to committee hearings and, and when asked, they will say, well, I'm not authorized to, to, to make that decision. Um, the commissioners are the governor's voice in the legislative process. The, the Constitution defines when we start and when we end the legislative process. He doesn't get to, and I, I kind of, um, in an effort to, to demonstrate uh, my frustration, took to saying, um, you know, the, the, the governor's latest number one priority or his, uh, you know, his, his second or third number one priority, uh, because he will show up with a week, I mean, in the last two years, one, one time it was, in fact, two years ago, it was, it was um, all day pre-K that didn't pass the House, didn't pass the Senate, and here we were with four days to go and it was his number one priority. Um, and then before we were done, there was another number one priority. Uh, the legislative process starts on January 3rd. He's gonna outline his budget and his priorities through that process. It's gonna be the governor's responsibility to gain support for those uh, in the legislative process. And, and that's gonna happen through the, the normally constitutionally defined process that we have here in St. Paul, in public hearings, in, um, you know, I, I think the problem is the governor has tried to overplay his hand in the past by not agreeing to things, by using the clock and trying to force people into a negotiation on special session. Um, eight times in the last two years, the governor has called for a special session. He's closed the deal once. He's one for eight. Um, I, I think it's time that we stop relying on special sessions and start participating in the regular session. And that's my advice to the governor. If, if I could, I'd like to just follow up on that. I'd like, I'd like to hear from the others. Is that what you envision as a public negotiation, that kind of 
uh, of an incident. I, I would almost call it an incident, almost an accident. No, and I want to answer to that too. You know, the, the governor, that, that's what tells me that someone's not serious. When people are firing letters back and forth, and by the way, every time the governor sends me a letter, you have it before I do. Not on accident. That you're, you're not, none of you are new to this. You understand what's going on. Um, that's posturing for the public, not solving problems. Um, and, and this is a relationship business. I started my comments today by saying that we did have uh, somewhat of a damaged relationship. We do. Um, and the governor's going to need to fix that if he's going to want his last two years in office to be successful. Um, he's, you know, uh, one of the other leaders uh, here has, has said that. Uh, he could be viewed as a lame duck governor at this point. Um, the voters took the legislature in a much different direction in the last election um, because they didn't like some of the hallmark policies that the governor put in place um, in his first six years. Um, it, he's going to need to, you know, it's going to be incumbent on him if he wants to accomplish his goals to participate in that process. And that, that meeting on Friday uh, was set up in front of the press not to get to a conclusion. Um, but to have a, a little dog and pony show for the media. And, and it wasn't even, uh, no one should call that a, a negotiations. It wasn't. That had the potential to be a productive meeting if it would have been preceded by a written counteroffer. I talked to the speaker uh, that morning, uh, well, actually the morning before, and I said, you know, if you were trying to sell me your car and you said, Representative Hortman, I think my car is worth 3500 And I said, no, I think it's worth 2500 And then you said, uh, no, well, I think it's at least $3,000. You know what I would say then? I'd say sold. That's how you get to a deal. I, I told the speaker, what the governor just put on the table was $3,500. Why don't you put $2,500 on the table and let's see if we can see $3,000. Let's see if we can get there. But in order to identify where the disagreement is, we don't need a, an itemized litany of complaints about how somebody's being treated. We need specific projects written down on a piece of paper. These are the ones we're willing to fight for. These are the ones of yours we're not willing to take. In order to find the middle, we have to know where the poles are. You know, the speaker is very fond of saying that the governor moves his goalposts. Well, at least he has goalposts. If I can address a couple of comments. Um, first of all, I was in what I thought was the final, final, final last deadline meeting. All of us were there, and, and I thought we had general numbers about where we were at. And so when the governor came back with a proposal that was significantly higher than that, it was not time for a counter offer. It was, that was the final offer. And so, so it was a difficult place that we were at. And so I understand why the speaker would have been upset. Um, you know, we have to figure out how we're going to work with the governor. I can tell you that uh, majority, which was in the Democratic hands in the Senate and the House Republican hands, could not get it done. So that tells me it's, it's more than just Republican Democrat. It's how do we work with the governor? One thing that we've decided in the Senate, Republican leadership and majority, is that it's going to be a different tone. Uh, we just feel like we're going to be more effective if, if we take a different approach. We, I don't want uh, any um, strongly worded letters to the governor with strongly worded letters back from the governor. I just don't think it's going to be effective. But, but in fairness uh, to everybody here, uh, it hasn't been just one side that has had difficulty in coming to agreements. It's been both sides. Well, first, I guess, let me say to, to the speaker, uh, uh, never underestimate a governor's resolve if he's not running again. This is uh, Governor Dayton's last chance to leave some kind of mark on Minnesota after a long career. And I would not underestimate that he's going to be pretty resolved on things that are important to him, and he should be. Uh, I, I've often kind of joked around here, governors tend to get most of what they want. And I think historically, uh, that's probably more right than wrong. Uh, and then to the question about uh, an open process and public meetings, that is what the conference committee process is designed to do. And to the extent I think we can work through that, and that's why one of my earlier comments was involving the administration in that process, to the extent we can engage the administration there, you'll have a public process. Uh, but I was here in 2005 uh, when Governor Plenty then decided, well, I'm going to make this process public, and that that's going to kind of flush everything out for everyone to see. Uh, 
and the conference committee discussions ended up in the reception room with the governor, with the House and Senate chairs, and what I remember is Senator Berglund winning the day. And uh, as it relates to health and human services, and some of you are chuckling because you remember those uh, days, and they tried, and it was all the th er, initial talk was, well, which direction is the camera going to point? Is it going to be on the governor? Is it going to be on Senator Berglund? And there was all this back and forth about these high-level negotiations that were going to take a place in the reception room. And the result of it all was a government shutdown. And we were down for, remember, the state parks were closed. Uh, we were down for, I think, nine days, uh, longest shutdown at that point. And it was a five or nine. I seem to think it was nine. Uh, but it could have been five. But anyway, that, when that process, which is a lot of what people are kind of talking about now, some of us have been through that already and it failed. So I'm not sure that's going to work. Uh, but I do think the process where we have open conference committees with the administration and the House and Senate all participating, this served this state pretty well over time. And it's, uh, uh, there's a reason it is what it is in the, in the joint rules between the House and the Senate. And I, I think if we all roll up our sleeves and want that conference committee process to work and the governor is willing to be engaged, I think we'll, we'll get a good outcome. David Montgomery, uh, Pioneer Press. We're almost an hour into this, and so far no one has mentioned the issue that last year and the year before all of the leaders said was the mo single most important issue to accomplish, which is transportation, uh, which was something that has been failed to come to a bipartisan, uh, bicameral agreement uh, both of the past two years. Is, the, is there any hope that transportation, there's some sort of deal on road bridge and possibly transit funding will happen this year, uh, given, given that there's still at some degree of divided government in Minnesota, or is that issue just going to have to go to the background with more important issues like the budget and health care to deal with? Who do you want to answer? Uh, you can start with the speaker. Okay. Um, you know, I, I'm optimistic that we can. Obviously, the number one issue, and, and I don't think anybody's going to disagree, has to be dealing with the health care crisis, health insurance crisis. Um, but, uh, you know, transportation, uh, and, and there's a, a funding cliff that's coming that we need to deal with uh, as well. Um, so the issue is becoming more and more important. Uh, obviously, uh, there were some pretty differing ideas on, on how to approach this in the last biennium, uh, or, or the current biennium, if you will. Um, the governor, at a time when, when Minnesota families weren't seeing the sort of surplus that the state government was seeing, um, his answer was the largest gas tax increase in state history. I think, I think that sort of approach was rejected in the last election. Um, and people in, in Minnesota, particularly in greater Minnesota, really aren't, you know, they aren't saying to themselves, I just can't wait to pay more taxes. Um, what they'd like is a, an economic recovery that, that will help their families in their own situation. Um, I, think, I think the thing that ultimately uh, doomed any transportation agreement in the last biennium, however, was the, the, the drastic overreach on the part of transit. Um, they weren't asking for a 10 or a 20 percent increase in, in transit funding, or even a 50 percent increase, or even a 100 percent increase, or 120, or 150, or 180, or 200. They weren't asking for a 220, 240. They were asking for a 260% increase in transit funding. Okay? That was the problem. It was just such a drastic overreach. Sorry for naming all those numbers off, but I think, you know, I think people would say, boy, a 50% increase sounds like a lot. What does a 260% increase in transit funding sound like? Um, so that they can build out their dream transit system. Let, let's, let's move to the next legislative session, not rehash history, please. What, what's going to happen? Well, okay. we're hopeful that we can get a, a transportation package, but what it's, and the reason I was setting the table for that is it's going to take people being realistic. We understand that, that we need transit in the state of Minnesota. It's important in greater Minnesota, just as it's important in the metro area. Um, and we understand that people rely on that. Uh, but we need to be reasonable about what we ask for. Um, we also know that, that folks out in greater Minnesota want some investment in our road and bridge infrastructure. Um, we tried to do that some with the, with the bonding bill. Um, and we think we can do that within the, the, the surplus dollars that are available. We put a plan on the table uh, in the last two years that we thought was much more reasonable and much more acceptable. Um, and, and we'll look 
look at something along that line again. We've got new chairs, so I want to give them an opportunity to kind of start working on this and, and have some hearings to wrap their mind around what approach they want to take before I get too, too committal to any specific plan, but we're optimistic. Yeah, I'll be surprised if we don't get a transportation uh, bill done with, with permanent fun funding without raising taxes um, using uh, present money. Uh, what finished in the House at the end could easily be similar to where we are today, but uh, just like the Speaker said, the Senate also has a number of new senators. We have a new transportation chair, and we're going to want their input, but I, there's no reason that we cannot get it done. Well, it's, it's hard. Uh, and the public, the public wants the roads and bridges fixed. They just want to pay for it. You can look at all the polling data. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple disconnect. Uh, and in the Senate, we've tried. Uh, uh, you know, we, we tried to convince a Democratic House in 2013 to do something permanent with dedicated funding on, for roads and bridges and uh, couldn't get a Democratic House to do it. In 15, we tried to do it in the Senate and couldn't get a Republican House to do it. So I guess I'm, I'm looking forward to the proposal and seeing if it's not new money who does it come from, right? I mean, there's X number of dollars available in this budget, and this legislature is going to decide what the priorities are and what the most important, urgent needs are. And uh, I've never supported the idea, as much as I want to fix roads and bridges, I've never supported the idea of taking it away from K-12 schools. I, I just haven't. And I, I hope that's not where we, uh, where we end up. But uh, that's just spoken as a grandparent who really cares about our K-12 school system, who has seven grandchildren that are oldest one in first grade. Uh, their future is going to be determined largely by the education that this legislature is willing to help pay for. Uh, so I, I just would add some caution if we're going to look at existing resources, uh, what kind of goes on the cutting room floor in order to be able to do that. Representative Horton, Horton. Uh, just to uh, focus your re response a little, the speaker criticized uh, transit funding, and particularly what he called the exorbitant uh, increase in transit funding, uh, where Democrats have traditionally uh, pushed for transit funding, uh, including in the last year. Uh, is, is, uh, is some is a significant increase in transit funding uh, a necessity for Democrats to sign on board to uh, any such package? Democrats like road, bridge, and transit funding. What we like is a balanced pa uh, package that serves all of Minnesota. The last time we passed a transportation finance bill in Minnesota uh, was in 2008 over a recalcitrant governor's veto, and it was balanced. It was um, very substantial investment, uh, mostly in bridges. We have no more fracture critical bridges in the state of Minnesota because we got the resolve together uh, to address that problem. But I think Senator Bach makes a really good point that when you look at the existing budget and you want to use existing resources, um, I sure would hate to see a cut target go to K-12, and I would hate to see a cut target go to HHS. Uh, we're talking about pe people in our community who have the most difficulty um, with their day-to-day -day, uh, daily activities of living. And um, typically, when we see Republicans in charge of the House, uh, we see a cut target, and that hurts people who are already the most vulnerable. So I, like Senator Bach, would agree that if we're really serious about um, doing something about the roads, the, our first preference would be long-term, stable, dedicated transportation funding that doesn't take money from school children or uh, people with disabilities or people in nursing homes. Uh, Tom Hauser again, just as a follow-up to that, by taking money from school children, are you talking about uh, diverting existing sales taxes that would usually go to the general fund, or uh, explain what permanent funding you're talking about? Senator Gazalka, you mentioned you think it can happen without raising taxes. Tell us specifically how that would be done. Well, first of all, we have a $1.4 billion surplus and a surplus moving forward, and so uh, I'm looking at that as one of the places that we invest the money. I've been in the majority in the House in 2005, and Republicans had that, and we gave the largest per pupil funding, I think, maybe 20, 30 years, 4% each year, and we didn't get credit for that. And the last time around uh, that we had the majority, we didn't cut education funding then. And so, you know, I think all four of us think that education funding is important. So, but we do have a surplus, which means what are we going to do with some of that? And we talked about the health care crisis, certainly roads and bridges and figuring out how to fund that. 
would be a good opportunity to use that for. That, that would be a one time. What about permanent ongoing funding? Well, I will tell you that each of our chairs will look at every, every uh, like health or K-12 or higher ed or whatever, and wh where are we spending our money, how are we spending our money, and we haven't looked at that in a while. The last four years, uh, spending has gone up, I believe, 18%, so it's not like we've been cutting anything. It's been growing, and I want to make sure that we're using the dollars wisely. I can tell you that uh, Senator Abler wants to take a real hard look at uh, our human resource delivery and what are we doing. Uh, is it efficient? Not the dollars going to the people that need it, but how the dollar, what the dollars are before they even get to them and how we're doing that. And so, um, you know, so that would be one of the areas that I'm going to be looking to, can we save money and still provide the services that we're, we're giving to those people? I just, as a follow, I'm still unclear on what specific funding sources for transportation you will look at. You're, you're talking about surplus, you're talking about savings elsewhere in state government. Seems to me that still isn't going to be enough. And I'd like everybody to chime in on this. I do think that will be enough. Speaker Dowd, uh, do you agree? General fund. Um, and that's been the problem. Nobody has wanted to spend general fund money on roads and bridges. Well, it's very difficult to go out and tell Minnesotans that when we have, you know, in the last biennium, a $2 billion surplus, but we need you to kick up the money that you put in uh, when you put your gas in the tank every day. Um, I, I think Democrats broke some promises to Minnesotans in the last biennium. The governor went out and said, I'm going to tax the wealthy and they're going to pay their fair share. Um, but he, he proposed increasing, he actually got one of them increased, uh, the most uh, uh, hurtful taxes to lower income folks. Um, and, and number one, it was the cigarette tax, raised at $1.60 a pack, much more disproportionately affects uh, low income Minnesotans. The other one is the gas tax. Um, so it's very difficult to say uh, to Minnesotans, you know, we have a $2 billion surplus. We've, we're collecting more money than we need from you. Um, and now we need you to kick in more. So we can pay for, by the way, the constitutionally defined core functions of state government. To me, the core functions get paid for before everything else. So uh, we're going to use some general fund money uh, to, to pay for our roads and bridges. And you know why? Because that's what Minnesotans expect us to do with the money that they give us. They want it to pay for the basics. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got enough money there to, to deal with the problem. Nope. Mike McEntee from the uptake. I'd like to talk about elections just for a moment since a lot of people are thinking. I'm sorry, can we just have, uh, sure. I'd like to hear from the minority as well. Senator Bach, could you just chime in on what you well, think about I, this? Well, you know, I think there's been about 15 times in the state's history that transportation has been on the ballot. And there's a reason that previous legislatures have always put that on the ballot because they've all known that unless you constitutionally dedicate that money, or unless you constitutionally build like the, 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 the highway system, uh, you can't bind future legislatures. And this legislature might be well-intentioned to put some general fund money into roads and bridges, but you can't bind the next one unless it's constitutional. And the highway system has always been a user fee system. It's why license tabs, the sales tax on motor vehicles, the gas tax, all are constitutionally dedicated to transportation so that future legislatures uh, can't undo a long-range transportation plan because it's constitutionally guaranteed. So I just would add some caution. Uh, it might be a priority today uh, to the legislature or to the voters that maybe transportation is the number one thing on people's minds right now and maybe that's where they want the general fund money spent. But a transportation plan is more than a two-year proposal. And we might all be sitting here two years from now, and the public's attitude about what's important might have radically changed, depending on circumstances totally unknown to us today. So I just would continue to urge caution. I've had little luck in the past I'm, I'm, uh, with Republicans and Democrats, including uh, the governor back in 13 and 14, that it needs to be a constitutionally dedicated revenue stream. And, and if, if they decide at the end that they want to put something on the ballot, to constitutionally dedicate those sales taxes on tires or auto parts or whatever uh, might be something I'm even willing to support. Uh, but if you're going to permanently dedicate general fund money to transportation, please consider doing it constitutionally so that the 20-year transportation plan that's developed can actually be executed and is not left to the whim of the next legislature to just not be a priority. 
did you did you have any addition? I agree with Senator Bach. I, I, mean, I think when you have a general fund budget and you have kindergartners competing with transportation funding, the kinder, kindergartners are usually going to win that fight. And that's why in 2008, when we put that package together, we worked so hard to have responsible, long-term, dedicated transportation funding. Okay. Mike McEntee from the FTK. I wanted to talk just quickly about elections because a lot of people are, of course, talking about that today. Um, Senator Mary Kiff Myers indicated that at some point during the biennium, uh, she plans to address the issue of requiring voters to use a photo ID to vote. And uh, given that we just had a constitutional amendment fail, I think, in 2012 by uh, a, at least a majority of uh, Minnesotans, is this a wise thing to raise again, Senator Gazelka? That would be your area, I believe. Uh, well, first of all, I was in that press conference and. Uh it wasn't something I think she was ready to talk about, but they asked and that was something she'd like to do. But she also added, I think rather forcefully, that she knows that we have to focus on the things that we all have been talking about, the health care crisis, roads and bridges, tax relief. You know, so I, that is not, I, I know it's important to her. I don't know that it's a high priority for her. Her high priority is the same things that we talked about that we all have to work on. So the other thing I would say about that is um, unless we have, 34 strong in the Senate that want to go that route, then it's not going to happen. So it's not a high priority for you then? It's not something that I've even discussed other than that uh, press conference with anyone. Speaker Dowd in the House? I, it's not something that we have talked about either, and I don't know that it will be a high priority for us. But I, I have to just on a personal level say I think it's the most common sense thing in the world. You have to have a, a driver's license to get welfare benefits or, uh, you know, a, a plethora of other things. Um, and I think, you know, valuing your vote and my vote means that nobody else gets to cast a vote who's not supposed to, because then it devalues your vote and my vote. So I think our election process is important. Uh, it's, it's somewhat unique in the world, and I think we need to protect it, but we have not had any conversations about passing anything like that. Um, I think there's, there's other things that can be done to, to you know, make sure that our elections are, are sound uh, as well. But, and we have some other election problems we have to deal with. We have a, a, a special election that was ha is happening now because uh, a, a district was determined that a, a member didn't live in their district, um, and they were removed from the ballot. Uh, the, the problem now becomes we're not filling the seat, um, and we're leaving that seat sit empty for, for a month and a half. Uh, with no representation. And I think it doesn't take too creative of a mind to figure out you can misuse that. Um, in fact, they could, they could file somebody in my seat against me that doesn't live in my district, and then once the filing period is closed, uh, have that person, have it challenged by themselves, um, have that person removed, and all of a sudden the Speaker of the House isn't sworn in with the rest of the House on January 1st. So uh, there's a huge potential for that statute to get misused, and I don't think anybody saw that when we passed it a couple of years ago. Um, so there's a fix that we definitely have to do there. And I think there's some other things in the elections that we uh, need to work on as well. And they, they probably should be non-controversial bipartisan things. And the other thing in elections that people are, of course, talking about today is the presidential electors and joining the uh, compact so that the majority vote winner, uh, popular vote winner, gets Minnesota's 10 electoral votes. What are your thoughts on those? I will introduce again my bill to uh, distribute electoral votes by congressional district, um, the way I think a couple of states do. I think uh, Nebraska and is it Maine that does it that way? I think there's two. Um, I think that makes more sense um, for us if we want Minnesota to be on the campaign trail for the presidential election. I, I just personally don't support uh, changing, you know, or entering into some creative way to get around our federal constitution to, to you know, distribute or change the Electoral College to a national popular vote. It's not. Um, the Electoral College was put in place for a reason. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think we can change the way we distribute our own electoral votes, which the Constitution gives us the right to do. Uh, but I don't think an end around on our federal Constitution is um, in the spirit of what our founding fathers had in mind. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? They probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let, me, let, me, let me just say on, on the issue of uh, election changes, the governor has been pretty clear that he's not going to sign uh, election or campaign related bills unless there's bipartisan support at the legislature. And the reason I remember that is then Speaker Thiessen and I wanted to do some things in 2013 and 14 when we had Democratic control uh, in the governor's office and in the House and Senate. 
And the governor was very clear with us when we met with him that he's not going to sign election bills that don't have bipartisan support. So we made a decision not to send them to him because we couldn't find something we could find bipartisan support for. So that would be my advice. Reach out to the governor if there's some election reforms you want to make. Uh, I would be surprised if his position on that has changed. Maybe, maybe moving the primary up earlier. Who knows? <laughs> Could you all actually address June support. primary? Could you all address June primary? There's some supporters at this panel. Is this the year for it? And as long as I'm here, Sunday sales. We doing Sunday sales this year? Yeah, what, do you, what do you want to ask? <laughs> well, let me start. I'm going to vote no on Sunday sales and yes on June primary. <laughs> Consistent position I've had. I've generally been no on Sunday sales, but I really want to see what our caucus thinks on that and uh, stay tuned. And June proper, uh, primary, I don't have a huge opinion on that. I liked it a little later so that uh, there was more opportunity to get your message out. But uh, again, that's not something that I'm passionate about. I think that we're going to pass Sunday sales out of the House this year. Um, I've had some conversations with my members uh, prior to them being appointed to the Commerce Committee. <laughs> so I think you might see some changes not only in that committee, but uh, in, in the House itself. I think it's just pastime. Uh, if a liquor store doesn't want to be open on Sunday, they don't have to, but uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, customers, uh, consumers, our constituents uh, would like them to have that flexibility and, and frankly would like them to be open. So um, I think that I predict that we will pass that out of the House this year. Um, June primary, I obviously have been uh, a, a supporter. I was the chief author the last uh, few times around and, and we almost got it passed. Uh, I think four years ago, um, ended up getting hung up over in the Senate, but... Uh... No, 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 no. Don't, don't rewrite history, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Both the party chair of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party came to the legislature and said, don't do this to us. So well, they, they, both, they both support it now. <laughs> they, were, they were both against it then. They both support it now. <laughs> I'm open-minded on Sunday sales. I've always been a no because it is a way to bring in big box retailers and really put small businesses at a disadvantage. But I um, am regularly, if not daily, uh, lobbied on this issue by my husband. So I'm pretty open-minded about getting it taken care of. And then with regard to June primary, I'm open-minded as well. Out of deference to my colleagues from the rural parts of the state, I have um, generally voted against it because the idea of me having a challenger in Brooklyn Park or Coon Rapids is one thing, but the idea of uh, Senator Bach having a challenger up north is a totally different situation when you're looking at a June primary. But I think uh, we'll have to talk to our caucuses and see where they are. On another drinking subject, the four of you can feel free to sit back and take some sips out of your Wilmer bottled water in front of you. I want to take a moment to the reporters. If you have, we're getting on the home stretch here, so if you have questions, you need to be waving your hands at me. And while I'm talking, probably go the rest of the 20 minutes, but I want to thank the Senate Sergeant at Arms Office for setting all this up and Senate Media Services for providing live streaming both on their website and for Forum Communications websites. Um, they do the work, I just sit here. As you all know, that's what I do best. Other reporters, Kyle, identify yourself please. Uh, Kyle Potter, Associated Press, uh, to the Republican leaders at the table. Um, the governor and the Met Council came up with a funding workaround for Southwest Light Rail. Does that make transportation easier in 2017, and do you plan to um, block or challenge that funding mechanism? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, well, I, I think they are intent to move forward, but I'm not sure at the end of the day that they will. Um, I know Met Council came out uh, just recently, I think within the last couple of weeks, if I remember right, and said that they have a, a fairly large uh, operating deficit uh, projected for, uh, I think it was next year, I don't remember all the details, but something in the $80 million range. Um, so I, I think we should perfect what we're doing now before we bite off more than we can chew, and I think that's a good, uh, it isn't about being pro-transit or anti-transit. It's just um, let's grow at a rate that we can afford and that we can uh, that's sustainable. Um, and I think uh, there are going to be some challenges uh, for Met Council in the next couple of years if they're if they're not able to operate what they have now and they want to do uh, more. It's going to be 
it's going to be difficult. I mean, and, and anybody with common sense would come to that conclusion. So uh, my guess is they'll probably take a second look at moving forward with Southwest Light Rail. So uh, first of all, if Southwest Light Rail is moving forward on a separate track, no pun intended, uh, then, well, actually was intended, but um, I think the rest of the, the transportation bill is, I think, much easier to work on. Uh, I think all of us here support bus transit. It's, it's really just been Southwest Light Rail and, and things like that. So, so if that's off, the, off the, on a different track, then I think it's far easier to get a transportation bill done. I'll also just chime in, if I can, really quickly on, um, I'll, I'll remind the local governments, whether it be CTIB and the, the partner counties that are part of that or Met Council, um, you made a decision to proceed with the capital investment on this project without the legislature. We believe that's a violation of state law. Um, but you made a decision to, to make the capital investment. Um, my hope is that you did that with the knowledge that you know where the operating money is coming from as well. You can fill in the blanks. Okay, a question from a greater Minnesota reporter. Trey Muse, Mankato Free Press. I know a lot of people in my neck of the woods are concerned about the $90 million farm land tax credit that was in the tax bill last year. Is that going to be part of tax legislation this year? Your uh, farm property tax or ag relief? Yeah, that, that for me personally is, is a very high priority. Uh, uh, they as ag prices or ag land has gone up, their portion of the taxes have gone sky high, and we looked at a number of ways to solve that, uh, passing that on to the local businesses or the local residents, and we just couldn't find something that everybody could agree on. I'm not sure it was the best policy in the world, but I think that it was a way to provide ag property tax relief that everybody could sign off on was, was the solution. So I. I, I personally definitely support that. I'm, I'm working with our tax chair now and we're, we're combining what are the things that we want to accomplish in a tax relief bill, but that would be very, very high priority for me personally. Yeah, I agree. I think we'll see it in whatever tax bill comes forward. Yeah. Well, um, let me just say on that, it, uh, it's being framed up as ag property tax relief. What, what it really was intended to do was help those small rural schools that have a lot of ag property in their districts so that they're able to pass voter-approved levies. And we've got school districts all over the place in the metro area here that are levying over $2,000 a pupil right. because the big buildings pay for it. And out in rural areas, it's the farmer that has the valuable land and can't afford the cost of voter-approved levies. So those schools are put at a huge disadvantage. So I think when we talk about that ag property tax relief, let's remember what we're doing is it's another credit in, in the rural area of the state to try and put some new money into their K-12 schools. And uh, so it really has a, it, it's a good proposal because it's got really two good purposes that everyone supports. I think it was very bipartisanly supported and in the House, I'm sorry, bipartisanly is not a word, I know that. <laughs> Rachel. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that, sorry about that. But uh, my deputy, Paul Marcord, who'll be sitting right next to me on the floor, I know will fight for that again this year. I have, on continuing rural issues, I have two I'll ask in one. Rural child care is being called a crisis now because it's very difficult to find child care centers in much of rural Minnesota. And I know Representative Franzen is working on that, but I'd like to hear your opinions on what can be done there. And the other thing is rural workforce housing. Uh, it, it happens in the urban areas too, but you don't have to drive as far as you do out in, in the center box area. If you have a new factory or something, there are some places that they can't get enough housing for the jobs that are open. I'd like to know from all four of you what can be done, what you think will be done this session, if anything. Well, Senator, there was, and Senator Gazelka can speak to this better than I can, but uh, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities had a proposal last year that ended up in the tax bill, or some version of it was, uh, in that tax bill to try and buy down some of the cost of uh, the development of workforce housing in rural communities. Uh, I support that. It's a priority to me. Uh, in my own personal case up in Cook County, up in Grand Marais, I mean, we have significant housing problems. Uh, Housing is very expensive up there because there's so little private land and construction costs are high because it's so far away from everywhere. 
So it's a place where uh, the traditional mortgage doesn't work. Uh, so I, I would uh, like to take another look at what the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities was proposing, what ended up in the tax bill, and I think it should be, uh, should be part of a final bill this year also. Yeah, so as, as uh, Senator Bach talked about, it is part of the solution for getting uh, job creators that want to expand out in rural Minnesota as long as they can hire people that have a place to live. So the two really have to go together. Uh, I realize it's probably more of a rural than a metro issue, but it is a, a rural issue. And as far as daycare, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we have a shrinking population out there which already compounds finding, finding employees and finding daycare providers, et cetera. Uh, but secondly, what we have to think about is we should not try to unionize them again. I think that really was a just a ice bucket of water thrown on them. They really found that offensive, and we saw that in the vote. Um, but adding to that, you know, all the different regulations that we have on these people, it's, it's typically a mom who wants to have a, a number of kids at home and you know be home with her own kids, and then have a group of people that she can take care of. And so if we're trying to expand that, we need to think about what are the regulations that we make it difficult for them to do what we all need them to do. You know, I, I, I think everybody knows that those are two areas where uh, Greater Minnesota could use some help. I, I, not enough in the weeds to know the details of the best way to help them, but you know, obviously one of the things that we did was create a committee on, on child care to, to, to tackle those issues. We did that um, in the last two years, uh, you know, along with uh, our, our first ever committee on uh, aging and long-term care, because we know that those are priorities, and that's another issue that, that affected Greater Minnesota uh, deeply. So uh, my hope is that that committee can, can dig into the child care issues. Um, we have, in, in recent years, tried to uh, make an impact on workforce housing. I know there are employers and, and communities that would grow uh, if they could, but um, it's difficult for them to find housing for uh, the workers that they need. So uh, obviously those are keys to helping our uh, you know, rural areas and, and greater Minnesota, their economies grow. And I think they'll be important keys. I think families across Minnesota struggle with the expense of child care and, and having access to high quality child care. So that's something that's a priority for us and has been for a while. Uh, with regard to housing, I, I don't think I can add anything except for I agree. Uh, this question, uh, I'd like House Speaker Dow to, to answer first. Uh, you toured the Minnesota Security Hospital with the governor earlier this year. Um, Security Hospital uh, is asking for $22 million, uh, in supplemental budget funding uh, for more staff out there. Is that going to be part of budget discussions this year? Uh, is further uh, funding for other state uh, hospitals uh, also going to be part of that discussion? We, we did uh, give a pretty substantial increase this last year, and, and I would suspect that we will be uh, taking a look at that. You're correct. I did uh, tour that facility. Um, not only were they asking for some uh, increase in operating um, monies, but also in some capital investment money, and those were in uh, the bonding bill that was on the table here uh, at the end of our special session negotiations. So um, they're, they're dealing with a, a, a pretty tough population on the on the sex offender side on the non sex offender side they're they're you know in some cases a tough population but but providing a, a pretty needed service um, and we need to make sure that we that we give the people that are working there the tools they need so that number one they're safe um, and and a very close number second they can be effective they can they can provide the uh, the service to those people and the treatment uh, that, that's required to get them uh, back on a, a more mainstream track uh, in, in their communities. So um, I, I, I assume it will be a, a, a big part of the discussion this next biennium. Uh, so I agree with the speaker's comments, uh, but I also want to say I've not served on the Capital Investment Committee, so it's not an area that I've been thinking about in any great detail. Uh, on the issue of taxes, uh, obviously Republicans now control the House and the Senate. Republicans are uh, usually synonymous with tax cuts. What specific tax relief or tax cuts will you pursue in the House and Senate this year? And how difficult do you think that will be? Uh, well, first of all, I think we should take a look at the tax bill that should have passed and didn't, and we'll go through 
a number of things in there that uh, you know that there was bipartisan support for. Uh, there were some things that the House also had uh, related to Social Security exemption that we certainly want to look at. We would have liked to have done. Uh, as far as the business property tax, uh, it may include the inflator as well. It's an automatic every year increase in, in uh, business property taxes regardless of what's going on. So those would be some things that I want to at least take a look at. Um, but I would say let's first start with where we were because there was a lot of agreement there. What are some of the things that we still have agreement and then some of the other things I mentioned. And Mr. Speaker, if you could also specifically uh, address that and also will there be any attempt to roll back the upper income uh, tax increases that went into effect a few years ago? I don't, I don't foresee that um, this year, but uh, I, I agree with what the Senator said. I think we're going to take a look at the tax bill that was on the table. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're, we're giving money back uh, to, to folks if we don't need it here in state government. And I think the fact that we've had surpluses now uh, indicates that we're collecting more money than we need. So um, I personally like, uh, you know, I was a big uh, proponent, as, as was Senator Bach. We, we actually worked on that together, the, um, the uh, exempting the uh, veterans retiree benefits. Um, that was a big deal. And I, I actually personally uh, would like to do the Social Security benefits. It's a, it's a bigger uh, piece of the pie, but um, I think it's important that those folks, I mean, all we're doing is it's tax dollars, we're paying them, and then we're taxing them on the tax dollars. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, plus, I think uh, you know our, our folks that are living on Social Security income have not seen a, a, a much of a COLA increase the last uh, four years, so um, it would be nice for them to be able to have that that income exempted from from taxes. I also like uh, the approach we took with the business, uh, kind of targeting it at small business by exempting the first hundred or hundred and fifty thousand of value uh, for everyone on the uh, uh, statewide business property tax. I think that that hit. Uh, a lot of small mom and pop Main Street businesses out in greater Minnesota, but it also impacted every business in the state. So um, I think that was a, a good approach as well. And and I also don't we don't like inflators. That's why the getting rid of the cigarette tax inflator and the uh, getting rid of this inflator would be important. When when Democrats are in the majority, they put tax increases in place and they put automatic inflators in case they lose the majority. Those taxes keep going up. Um, I think that signs away the legislature's ability to to do their job. And and it's up to the legislature if they want to increase taxes to do it, and if they want to decrease taxes to do it. And, and we shouldn't put anything on an automatic pilot like that. Well, uh, just want to remind everybody, I don't know if you saw the USA Today uh, results from, I think it's less than two weeks ago now, where the Group 24-7 Wall Street announced that they had finished their most recent study and that Minnesota was, uh, from a fiscal standpoint, the second best state run in the country. That North Dakota was first, Minnesota was second from a fiscal perspective. A uh, number of different criteria that go into that. Uh, New Mexico was 50th, Illinois was 49th. I didn't look at everybody that was in between there. But I mention that because uh, this state does have very good fiscal health with a, a very, very nice uh, budget reserve right now. Uh, that a provision that the Senate put in in 2014, and just want to urge caution in the tax bill as it relates to phasing in uh, proposals like Social Security going forward. I remember when we did the single sales ratio and uh, back in 2001, I believe, uh, so the businesses only pay on sales they actually make in Minnesota. Uh, we phased that in over 14 years because these big tax changes like that uh, and a big tax change like uh, exempting Social Security would have to be phased in over a number of years for us to afford it. So just be very careful that we don't overcommit future revenue. We are closer to the next recession than we are away from the last one. They come. Uh, so just be careful when phasing things in. On Social Security, just let me say, we treat Social Security income just like the federal government does. I think on a, on, a, on a couple, we don't tax it until they get to about $35,000 in income. So let's just be careful. Uh, a whole lot of people are not paying taxes on their Social Security now. And so what I'd be interested in seeing is kind of the run of, if we did totally exempt Social Security completely, where does the money go? Because if nobody, if no family of two people with under 35000 income get a penny, where do those hundreds of millions of dollars go? So I, th I think that's a, a good conversation, I think, for us all to have, and it might make sense. 
Uh, it might all go to the middle class who needs some help, but there's a, a, a lot of data to look at, and I just think people need to understand, and I think the public sometimes doesn't understand that we treat it the same way the federal government does right now. My caucus will be looking at tax proposals to see how they are for Minnesota families. And if Minnesota families fare well, then we'll be supportive. But if the tax cuts go to special interests or just commercial or big businesses, then we're not likely to support them. We're about out of time. Promise David one last question. Don't take too much time on it. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I will see if you guys can because this is a, not an easy one. Uh, it's, it touches both the intersection of both the budget, which is going to be contentious this year, and social issues, which are always contentious. Uh, for the Republicans in particular, uh, are we going to see a push, and particularly a concerted, insistent push, on uh, w as working the budget in terms of funding for Planned Parenthood, uh, which has been an issue in a lot of years and could be a, a real sticking point potentially between the Republican-controlled legislature and uh, Governor Dayton? I can only speak for the Senate and simply say that we have not talked about it at all yet, one way or the other. And you know, I, I like to say that nothing's off the table, but we are really going to do our best to focus on some of the main things that we've been talking about here. Uh, a number of groups uh, have a number of issues that they would like to uh, have us address, and we'll take them one at a time and see where our caucus goes. And we have had no conversations about that, so I don't uh, anticipate. I think that would be a colossal mistake as Planned Parenthood provides a tremendous uh, service for women, a full range of health care services, not just women, uh, women and men. And I think that in the state of Minnesota, we have seen really good results from increased availability of birth control. I think that's something that people on both sides of this issue should be able to support. So I think that would be a, a really big mistake for the health of Minnesotans and particularly for the health of women in the state of Minnesota. My first chance to digress from the question, please don't cut higher ed. In 2011, higher ed, when we went home in May, was cut by 19%. And at the end of the shutdown in July of 11, higher ed ended up with a 14% real cut in their budget. We have some of the highest tuition in the country at our two-year colleges, second highest last time I looked. Student debt coming out of college is becoming a tremendous burden on people. And I mention it because it's the easiest place in the budget to cut. Because you can cut and the institutions can backfill with tuition. So it's an easy cut to make, but our, our tuition is spiraling out of control and we are gonna put higher education out of the reach of just regular working class families. There are a lot, lot more issues we could talk about, but we have a whole legislative session to do it. And I guarantee you, we'll be asking you these questions. But for now, for News Service, thanks the four of you for sitting there on the hot seat today. And we look forward to it again. Let's do it again next year. Thank you all. <laughs>